Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about instantaneous slope and tangents, which are also called derivatives. While there are many other things we could explore in limits, we have now enough of an understanding to move on to another major topic in calculus, the derivative. The derivative of a function gives us a way to talk about how fast the function is changing. It allows us to find the instantaneous slope, which is also called the instantaneous rate of change. They mean equivalent things. And this is a new idea, which we'll go over in just a moment. At first glance, knowing a function's rate of change at any location may not seem that useful, but it actually tells us a massive amount of information. It lets us easily find maximums and minimums. It lets us find increasing or decreasing intervals and many other things. Knowing the derivative of a function is really, really useful. For example, if a function gives the location, if we've got some function that gives the location of an object, Object. The derivative of that function will tell us the object's velocity, because derivative tells us the rate of change. If we know something's location, and then we talk about the rate of change of that location, well, the rate of change of your location is what your speed is, effectively. So that gives us velocity, since velocity is pretty much speed. This is really useful stuff. Being able to talk about derivatives of a function is really, really useful, and it forms one of the cornerstones of calculus. Let's check it out. Long, long ago, when we first took algebra, we were introduced to the concept of slope. We can think of slope as the rate of change that a line has. How fast is it moving, in a way? That is, how far up does it go for going some amount horizontally? We define slope as the vertical change divided by the horizontal, which is also the rise divided by the run. So rise over run, the amount that we have changed vertically divided by the amount that we've changed horizontally. This tells us how fast our line is changing. It tells us the rate of change, the slope, how much it moves on a moment by moment basis for a line. One step to the right, how much will we go up or down? The idea of slope makes a lot of sense for a line because its rate of change is always constant. But what if we wanted to apply the idea of slope to a non-line, something like, say, a parabola, just for example? The first thing to notice is that for most functions, slope is constantly changing. Not necessarily all functions. For a line, it isn't changing. But anything that isn't a line, the slope won't be the same everywhere. The rate of change for a function varies depending on what location we consider. For example, on this one, how fast it's changing is totally different in this area Area. It's totally different from this area and totally different from this area. Each of those three areas is going in a very different rate of change. The way it's moving there is very different, right? In this area over here, it's mainly going down. In this area over here, it's mainly just going horizontally. And in this area over here, it's mainly going vertically, right? There's always some horizontal motion in this case, but it winds up changing how it's moving. So it doesn't have a constant slope. Its slope is changing for these things. So we want to have some way of being able to talk about what is the slope at this place? What does it change to in this moment? So we can't talk about a rate of change slope for the entire function, but we can look for a way to find the instantaneous slope. What is the slope at some specific point? So here, it's changing at this moment at some current speed, right? It's going like this here. But here, it's going like this. Or here, it's going like this. And here, it's going like this. Right, we wind up getting these different ways of being able to talk about how it's moving in this moment. Where is it going from one spot to the next spot? How is it changing at that place? Another way to work towards this idea of instantaneous slope at a point is through the notion of a tangent line. Now, there, let's have a, just a quick break from this. There is a slight relationship between the trig function tangent and the tangent line of something, but it's really not worth getting into. It's not going to really help us understand things, and the connection is only really sort of tenuous. So for now, let's just pretend that they're two totally different ideas, and they just happen to have the same name. So tangent, when we talk about taking the the tangent of some angle, tan of some angle, and when we talk about the tangent line on a curve, they're nah, completely unrelated, at least as far as we're concerned right now. It's easier to think about it that way. All right, so back to what we are talking about. For a circle, the tangent line to a point on the circle is a line that passes through the point but intersects no other part of the circle. So consider this point right here on the circle. The tangent line will go through that point but it will not intersect. It will intersect no other part. So we look at it, and we see that we get 
this right here, right? See how it barely touches, it just sort of just touches, just feather touches that one point on the circle, but it touches nothing else. I want you to notice how the tangent line is basically the instantaneous slope of the curve at that point. If we look in this region, right here at our point, that's how much the curve is changing at that moment. So it's as if the tangent line is going the same direction as the curve in that one location. We can take this idea of a tangent line and expand it to any curve. If we've got some function f of x, when we draw its graph, we've just got a curve on our paper. Now, we can consider some point on the graph and try to find a tangent line at that point. So say we've got some point like right here. And we want to do the same thing of just barely feather touching that one location and going in the same direction as the graph is going. So it will pass through that one place, but just barely just going in the same direction as the curve is in that moment. We look at that and we see how that has the instantaneous slope. Notice the tangent line is the instantaneous slope of the curve at that point, right? This curve right here has what the slope is at this one place, but if we go to some other place, we'd wind up having a totally different tangent line for these different points, right? If a tangent line were to pass through these different points, it would have a totally different slope. So the tangent line is going in the same direction as the curve is at that moment, at that single point. At a different point, it might wind up having a totally different tangent line, having a totally different slope. So how can we find this instantaneous slope? What can we do to work towards this slope at some point? Well, Let's say we wanted to find the specific instantaneous slope for the function f of x equals x squared plus 1 at a horizontal location of x equals 1. So here is the point that we're trying to find the instantaneous slope. And notice that we are at the the, currently at the horizontal location x equals 1. How could we do this? What could we do to approach it? Well, long ago, when we talked about the properties of functions, we noticed how we could talk about the average slope between two horizontal locations, x1 and x2, as a f on a function with this formula here. The average slope between these two points, these two horizontal locations, x2 and x1, is f of x2 minus f of x1 divided by x2 minus x1. Well, why is that? Well, if we've got some other point that's at some x2, right? Well, what height will that wind up being at? Well, that will wind up being at a height of, to find the height, we just evaluate the horizontal location, right? Your input is your horizontal location, your output is your vertical location. So that would come out to be f of x2. What input did we have? Well, we put in x1. So we'd have an output of f of x1. So our top, the change, is going to be the difference f of x2 minus f of x1, because we went to f of x2 and we came from f of x1. So the difference in our ending and our starting is f of x2 minus f of x1. So that tells us the top part of our average slope formula. The bottom part of it, well, if we go from x1 to x2, then that means our horizontal motion is going to be x2 minus x1, right? If we go to 10 from 2, we've traveled 8, 10 minus 2. And so that's why we divide by x2 minus x1. It's the rise, how much we've changed vertically, divided by how much we've changed horizontally. So we've got our function f of x equals x squared plus 1. And we want to know the slope at x equals 1 is what? What is the value? All right, so we've got our slope average formula, m average equals f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1. Now, we want to know the slope at x equals 1. So we can use this average slope formula to give us approximations. By using the average slope formula, we can get approximations for what the slope is near x1, near x equals 1, near the slope for our finding our instantaneous slope at x equals 1. So since we want to find it near x equals 1, we want to find it specifically at x equals 1, let's set the first thing that we'll use in our average slope formula as x1 equals 1. So we establish this as being x1. For our first approximation, let's use a horizontal location that happens to be two units forward. So we'll have our second horizontal location be moved two forward, so we go forward 1, forward 2, and that makes 3x2. Or we could have x2 equals x1 plus 2, right? x1 plus 2. And since we're using x1 equals 1, we've got 1 plus 2, which comes out to be 3. So we've got x1, x2. So we're looking to find the average slope between these two points. 
All right, so our formula, sorry, our function is f of x equals x2 plus 1. We're looking for our instantaneous slope at x equals 1. We're working towards that by approximations right now. And our average slope formula is f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1. We know that x1 equals 1 because that's the point that we're interested in finding the slope for. So we'll just set that as sort of a starting place to work from. And we decided for our first one to go with x2 equals x1 plus 2, which was 3. So using our formula, m average, we've got m average equals equals f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1. x2 is 3, so if we plug that into f of x, then we've got f of x2 equals 3, so f of x2 is f of 3. f of 3 would come out to be 3 squared plus 1. 3 squared plus 1 gets us 10. For f of x1, f of x1 would be f of 1 f of 1 would be 1 squared plus 1, so that gets us 2, so it's 10 minus 2 on the top, and then x2, 3 minus x1, 1, so 3 minus 1 on the bottom. We simplify the top, we get 10 minus 2 becomes 8, 3 minus 1 becomes 2, 8 divided by 2 gets us 4, and if we draw it in, we wind up getting this purple line right here. That's the slope if we set it equal to to that average slope, it winds up passing through those two points. So we've got an average slope of four between those two horizontal locations. Okay, that's not a bad start. It's far from perfect. We can clearly see this line right here is not, in fact, the tangent line, right? It's not the tangent line. It doesn't perf doesn't pass perfectly against that point. It doesn't just barely feather touch that one point. It isn't going in the same direction. But it does give us an approximation. It's a start. So how can we make this approximation better? Well, we probably go, well, the issue here is the fact that x2 is too far away. We want x2 to be closer. So we can improve it by bringing x2 closer to x1. So this time, let's go with only one away. We'll do x1 plus 1, so it's only one distance forward. So we'll now have x1 plus 1 or 2. Since we're starting at 1, 1 plus 1 gets us 2. So now we're only one horizontal distance away. Still the same, fu uh, same function, x squared plus 1, still looking for x equals 1, still the same slope average formula. x1 still equal to 1, but now x2 is going to be 1 forward from 1, so that's 2 for our x2. We plug that into our average slope formula. f of x2 is f of 2 in this case, because that's our x of 2, x2 at this place. So f of 2 would be 2 squared plus 1. 4 plus 1 gets us 5. Minus f of x1. f of x1 is still 1 squared plus 1, so that still gets us minus 2. Our bottom is now x2 minus x1. Our new x2 is 2 in this case. 2 minus 1, that simplifies. 5 minus 2 on top becomes 3. 2 minus 1 on the bottom becomes 1. One, and so we get a slope of 3. And if we graph that, we wind up getting this line right here. All right, nice. We're getting better. It's still not perfect, but the approximation is improving as we bring x2 closer to x1. So as we bring our x2 closer and closer and closer, we're going to wind up getting better and better approximations. So what we want to do is we want to bring it really close. Before we can bring x2 really close, though, we need to think about what we're doing in general so we can figure out an easy way to formulate talking about bringing x2 really, really close. So let's talk about what we've been doing in general. So we've got our average slope formula. m average is equal to f of x2 minus f of x1 divided by x2 minus x1. The output of our second point minus the output of our first point divided by the horizontal location difference of our second and first point. So what we did first was, since we're looking to use this m average formula, we set x1 at some value. In this case, we set it at the point that we're interested in, right? We wanted to find the slope of x equals 1, so we set our first point, our first horizontal location as x1 equals 1. First horizontal location is 1 because we want to find out about that slope. Then from there, we set x2 some distance away from it, right? The very first time we set it, two distance away. So 1 plus 2 became 3. The second time we did this, we had 1 plus 1, a 1 horizontal distance. 1 plus 1 became 2. So we want to bring x2 closer and closer by putting less and less distance. So what we really care about isn't so much the second point, but the distance to the second point, right? Two different ways of looking at this. So let's call this distance something. We'll call it h. 
Because what we want to do is we want to bring this h smaller and smaller and smaller. We want to bring h closer, we want to bring x2 closer and closer, so we want to make the distance between our point that we care about and the point that we're sort of referencing against for our average slope to become closer and closer and closer. So if we're calling this distance h, then we can say x2 is equal to x1, our starting place, plus the distance away h. So x2 equals x1 plus h. With this in mind, we can now rewrite our average slope formula in terms of x1. So we started with m average equals f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1. But now we've got this new way of writing x2. x2 is equal to x1 plus the distance forward h. So we can re rewrite the formula in terms of x1 and the horizontal distance h to be able to create a new formula. So m average, and not a new formula so much as a restatement of the old formula, but a new way of looking at it. So we plug in x2 here, now becomes x1 plus h, so we've got x1 plus h. f of x1, well, that's still the same, so f of x1 plus h minus f of x1. x2 now becomes x1 plus h minus x1, still x1, so minus x1. On the bottom, we've got x1 here and minus x1 here, so we can cancel them out, and so we're left with just h here. On the top, though, we can't cancel anything out because f of x1 plus h and f of x1, we don't know how they can pair until we apply some specific function to them. So we're going to have to use the function before we can cancel anything out. We can't cancel out the x1 part inside of the function because we have to see how h interacts with x1 before we can cancel anything out. Okay, so one last thing to notice. At this point, the only thing showing up is x1, right? Only x1 shows up in this formula, right? We've got x1 here, x1 here, x1 here, x1 here, x1 here, x1 here, but no longer x2, right? x2, we don't have to care about it anymore because instead we're thinking in terms of this distance h. That's how we swap to x1 plus h. So we don't really care about x1 versus x2, then we can just rename x1 as simply x because at heart we're all lazy and it's easy to write out x compared to x1, right? Just one less thing to write. So we can now write our average slope as the average slope is equal to f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. All right, so going back to our thing, we've got our function is x squared plus 1, back to our specific example, and we want to find out what's the slope at a specific value of x equals 1. So for any h, for any distance away from our, our location x equals 1, the average slope is going to be equal to f of x plus h minus f of x all divided by h. Let's see how that's the case. Well, if we've got x here, and we've got x plus h here, then the distance forward we've gone is x plus h minus x, or simply h. So that's why we're dividing by h, because we divide by the run, we divide by the horizontal change. And if we want to look at the two heights, well, the height that we'll end at will be f of x plus h, right? If we plug x plus h to get an output, it's going to be f acting on x plus h. What is the, in the first one, our first location is going to be plugging in x, so that would be f of x, right, f acting on our input of x, so f of x. What's the distance that we wind up having? Well, that'll be f of x plus h minus f of x, and so that's why we wind up having f of x plus h minus f of x on the top. So for any distance h that we wind up going out, that tells us what the average slope is between our horizontal location x and the h that we wind up choosing, whatever distance we wind up, telling, we wind up wanting to use. So as we make our h smaller and smaller, we'll be able to get better and better approximations. If we want to see why we wind up getting better and better approximations, notice, let's look at a couple, let's look at a couple different points, right? If we choose different points, and we wind up running lines through these different slopes, we wind up seeing that we get closer and closer to the actual tangent we want, right? Getting closer and closer to the tangent we want. So as we bring our h closer and closer, so we make our h shorter and shorter and shorter, we get better and better approximations. So as h grows smaller and smaller, our slope approximation becomes better and better. Now what would be great is if we could somehow set h equal to zero, right? We want to have the smallest amount of space we could possibly have. The less distance we have, the better our approximation. But if we were to set h equal to zero, then we'd be dividing by h, right? It's f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. So if h equals zero, eh, we divide by zero right? We can't divide by zero because that doesn't make sense. It's not defined. So what we want, if only there was some way we could somehow have the same effect 
as dividing by zero, but not have that issue where we're actually causing it to divide by zero. If only we could look at what it was going to become the instant before it wound up breaking on it. Limits. That's what that whole thing we were studying with limits was about. Limits give us a way to talk about what will it become before it breaks, right? What is it going to become just before it winds up dissolving and not actually making sense? So we want that infinitesimally small as h gets really, 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 really close to zero, what winds up happening? So what we're looking for is the limit as h goes to zero. As this becomes really, really close to actually being on top of that point, what value do we wind up getting out? That's gonna be the best sense of what the instantaneous slope is. By getting it really, really, really close, we'll be able to get our best idea of what is the slope at that exact place. All right, so with this idea in mind, let's take the limit as h goes to zero of our average slope formula for f of x. So our average slope formula is m average equals f of x plus h minus f of x all divided by h. So what we do is we take the limit as h goes to zero because the limit as h gets smaller and smaller, our average slope will give us a better and better approximation. As h goes to zero, as h becomes infinitesimally close to it, we'll wind up getting the best possible approximation. The limit just before the instant it touches, that's the best possible approximation we can get for what the slope is at that place. So at this point, we can now plug in f of x equals x squared plus 1 into our specific f of x up here and start trying to work towards what is the formula for what the slope will be at that place at our location x. So if we've got f of x plus h and we're plugging it into f of x equals x squared plus 1, so we're plugging in x plus h into something squared plus 1, so we get x plus h squared plus one, because that's what our function does. So x plus h squared plus one for our first portion, and then minus, when we plug in just x, we wind up just getting x squared plus one. So minus x squared plus one, and the bottom is just h, because we don't have anything to affect the bottom yet. So limit as h goes to zero, well, we can expand x plus h squared. x plus h squared becomes x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. The plus one still remains. And minus quantity x squared plus one is minus x squared minus one. At this point, we see, hey, we've got x squared, positive x squared, and negative x squared, so they can cancel each other. We've got positive one and negative one, so they can cancel each other. And we're left with 2xh plus h squared on top, all divided by h. The limit as h goes to zero of 2xh plus h squared, all divided by h. Hey, great. So if we just plugged in zero initially, it would wind up breaking, right? We'd have zero over zero, so we don't wind up getting anything out of it. But at this point, we can now cancel things. That's one of the things we talked about when we wanted to evaluate limits. Remember the lesson finding limits? How do we find these limits? We get them to a point where we can cancel stuff so we can see what's going on. So at this point, we can cancel. We have 2xh plus h squared over h in our limit. So we see we can cancel this h. That'll cancel the h here. And over here, it'll cancel the squared and turn it to just h to the 1. So at this point, we've got it simplified to the limit as h goes to 0 of 2x plus h. And as h goes to 0, 2x won't be affected, but the h will wind up canceling out as it just drops down to 0. And we'll be left with 2x. Now, what point did we care about? We cared about the horizontal location. We wanted to show slope at x equals 1. So we've now got this nice formula to find out what is the slope at some horizontal location. So we can plug in our x equals 1, and we have the instantaneous slope when the horizontal location is x equals 1. We know what the slope of f of x is at the single moment, that single horizontal location of x equals 1. 2 times 1, we plug in our value for our x, 2 times 1 comes out to be 2. Yay! We've found what the slope is. Let's check. Let's see it graphically. If we check this against the graph, we see that a slope of 2 at the horizontal location x equals 1 produces a perfect tangent line. This slope of 2 at the horizontal location x equals 1, right here, produces a perfect tangent line to the curve at that point. If we draw a line that goes through that point that has this slope of 2, we wind up seeing that it does exactly what we're looking for. It has this bare feather touch just barely on that curve. It just barely touches that one point and it goes off in the direction that the curve has at that one instant, at that one horizontal location, that one point. Cool. So this leads us to define the idea of a derivative. We can do what we just did here for this one specific function in general. So we define the derivative. The derivative is a way to find the instantaneous slope of a function at any point. So the derivative of the function f at some horizontal location x is f prime of x. We read this f with this little tick mark is f prime of x. 
And it is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all divided by h. So our average slope, as our average slope gives us a better and better sense of what's happening at that instant at that horizontal location x. Right? As our h shrinks down, we get a better and better sense of what's going on from this average slope thing right here. And since we have a better and better sense, the best sense we'll have is the instant before it actually winds up breaking on us at h equals 0. So we take the limit as h goes to 0. Now, of course, this limit has to exist. If the limit doesn't exist, then the derivative doesn't wind up working out. But as long as the limit does exist, we manage being able to find out what that instantaneous slope is. We call the process of taking a derivative differentiation. This is called differentiation. So we take the derivative through differentiation. You can differentiate a function to get its derivative. And when we write it out, it's just this little tick mark right here, f prime of x. So you just put this little tick mark right next to your letter that is the letter of the function and that says the derivative of that function. Once we have the derivative f prime of x for some function f of x, we can find the instantaneous slope at some specific horizontal location x equals a by simply plugging it into our general derivative formula f prime of x. So if we want to know the instantaneous slope at some horizontal location a, we just plug it into f prime of x and we've got f prime of a. Just like we did before, we figured out that in general, for x squared plus 1, f prime became 2x, and then we wanted to know what it was at the specific horizontal location of 1, so we took f prime of 1, we plugged in 1 for our x, and we got simply 2 as the instantaneous slope at that location. The derivative is a very very important idea in calculus. It makes one of the absolute cornerstones that calculus is built upon. And so there wind up being a number of different ways to denote it. Given some y equals f of x, that is some function f of x where we could talk about it as the horizontal, the, uh, sorry, the vertical location y, we can denote the derivative with any of the following. So we can talk about the derivative with any of the following symbols. f prime of x, dx over dy, y prime d over dx of f of x, and there's even some other ones. In this course, we'll wind up using f prime of x for the limited period of time that we actually talk about derivatives, but these other ones will wind up being used occasionally as well. And there's reasons why they wind up being used. They actually make sense in calculus. We don't quite have time to talk about it right now. But as you work through calculus, as you study calculus, see if you can start to understand why we're talking about it as dx over dy. It has to do with these idea of infinitesimals, but I'll leave that for you working in your calculus course. All right, so the important thing to know is that while there's all these different ways to talk about it, right? We've got just four right here, but there's even more occasionally, but you'll only wind up experiencing really these two right here are really likely the most common ones you'll wind up seeing. And this is the only one we'll use in this course. They all do the same thing. They represent some function. They represent the derivative that tells us the instantaneous slope for a horizontal location. We plug in a horizontal location, and it tells us what the instantaneous slope is, what the slope is, what the rate of change is at that one specific horizontal location. The important idea of all of this that I really want you to take away is that as you progress through, so the important idea, we'll work to it, as you progress in calculus, you're quickly going to learn a wide variety of rules. You're going to learn a lot of different rules, a lot of different techniques that will make it really easy, that will make it much easier to find derivatives. Things that at first seem complicated will actually wind up becoming pretty easy as you learn rules and get used to using rules in calculus. And actual, in actuality, you will very seldom, if ever, use that formal definition that we we just saw. That limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. That thing won't actually wind up getting used a lot. We'll mainly wind up using these rules and techniques that you'll learn as you go through calculus. So if that's the case, if we wind up not really using it that much, why did we learn it? What was the point of learning it? Because the important part, the reason why we're talking about all this, is to give you a sense of what the derivative represents before you get to calculus. What we really want to take away from this is that the derivative is a way to talk about instantaneous slope. It's a way to talk about how something is changing. And equivalently to instantaneous slope is the instantaneous rate of change. How is the function changing in this one moment, at this one point, at this one horizontal location? How is it changing? What is its slope right there? of a function. So it's what is it right there of this function, some specific location. That's the idea of a derivative. So as you learn these rules, no matter how many rules you learn for finding derivatives, never forget that at heart, what a derivative is about 
the, the derivative is a way to talk about a function's moment-by-moment -moment change. It's this idea of how is the function changing right here, right now? What is the slope at this specific place? You'll wind up learning a lot of rules. You'll wind up learning a lot of techniques. And it's easy to wind up getting tunnel vision and focusing only on the rules and techniques and getting the right numbers out, getting the right symbols out. But even as you're winding up working on this, try to keep that broad idea of what you're thinking about is how the thing is changing, how your function is changing on the whole. You'll have to understand how to get those correct values, how to get those correct symbols when you differentiate, when you take the derivative. But if you forget that the idea of all of this is to talk about the rate of change, you're missing the most important part. The most important part that makes all of this actually have meaning. To be useful is this idea of how is the function changing here and now. That's why we care about the derivative. Not just so we can churn out numbers, not just so we can churn out symbols, but so that we can talk about how is this thing changing right here and right now. And by understanding that the derivative represents how is this thing changing right here and right now, and thinking about it in those terms, you'll be to understand all of the larger ideas that we get out of a derivative of what the derivative represents and all the interesting things that a derivative tells us about a function. If you just try to memorize the techniques and rules and that's all you focus on, you won't have a good sense for what you're doing and it'll become very difficult in calculus. But if you keep this idea in mind of what it represents, it'll be easy to understand how things fit together and make things a lot more comfortable, make things make a lot more sense. So the important part of all this that I really want you to take away is Keep the derivative in mind as a way of talking about how the function is changing at some specific location. What is its slope right there? All right, we're ready for some examples. Let f of x equal x cubed and consider the location x equals negative 2. So we've got some function x cubed and we're considering the location x equals negative 2. Approximate the slope, that is the instantaneous slope, using our slope average function f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h and the following values for h. So for our first one, h equals 2. If our x is at negative 2, then our x is going to be at negative 2 for h equals 2. x plus h, right, this portion right here, x plus h will be equal to, well, if it's negative 2 for x and h is 2, then 2 plus negative 2 comes out to be Let's write it the other way around, x plus h. So negative 2 plus 2, right? x plus h. Negative 2 plus 2, well, that'll come out to be 0. So now let's plug it into our average slope formula. So the average slope is equal to f of x plus h, that was 0, minus f of x, that's negative 2, the point we're concerned with, divided by h, the distance we're going out is 2. We start working this out. The average slope f of 0, well, if it's x cubed, that's 0 cubed minus negative 2 cubed, all divided by 2. So that comes out to be 0 minus negative 2 cubed is negative 8 over 2. 0 minus negative 8 becomes plus 8, so we've got 8 over 2, which equals 4. So this first approximation at h equals 2 is we wind up getting average slope of 4. Next one h equals 1. So once again, our first place will be x equals negative 2, and then we're working from there, x equals negative 2. So x plus h will be equal to negative 2 plus 1. We're going one distance out from negative 2, which simplifies to negative 1. So our average slope between negative 2 and negative 1 is going to be f of x plus h, so f of negative 1 minus f of negative 2 over positive 2. What is f of negative 1? Well, that's going to wind up being negative 1 cubed. We already worked out that minus negative 2, f of negative 2, minus f of negative 2 becomes negative negative 2 cubed, which becomes negative negative 8, which became just plus 8. So we can just write that as plus 8 right now, skip to that part. Divided by 2, negative 1 cubed becomes negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1, just negative 1 plus 8. Oh, whoops, sorry, it's not divided by 2. Sorry about that. Our h is 1. That's what we're using as our h. I accidentally got stuck on h equals 2. So we're dividing by 1 because it's distance out 1. Negative 1 cubed plus 8, negative 1 plus 8. So we've got 7 over 1, which equals an average slope of 7 between x equals negative 2 and going a distance of 1 out. Our final one, x h equals 0 0.1. So our h is still equal to the same starting location, negative 2. But now we're going out the very tiny x plus h equals negative 2 plus 0 0.1, which gets us 1.9. So just a tiny little bit forward now. So our average slope is going to be f of negative 2, uh, sorry, 
not negative 2. We do x plus h first, and this should be negative 1.9 because it's negative 2 plus 0 0.1. So x plus h is f of negative 1.9 minus f of negative 2, all divided by our h is 0 0.1 f of negative 1.9 is going to be negative 1.9 cubed. We already figured out that minus negative 2 cubed becomes plus 8 divided by 0 0.1. Negative 1.9 cubed becomes negative 6.859. Now plus 8 divided by 0 0.1. So that simplifies up top to 1.141 divided by 0 0.1. We divide by 0 0.1 and that moves the decimal over and we get 11.41. Great. And so that gives us our final average slope of h equals the tiny distance of 0 0.1. So notice, at the very large distance we got 4. At h equals 2 we got 4. At h equals 1 we got 7. At h equals 0 0.1 we got 11.41. We're slowly approaching some specific value for what it is, right? What we're trying to figure out, if we were to draw a graph here, what we're trying to figure out is here is x cubed. What we're trying to figure out is what is the slope at x equals negative 2, what is the slope that goes through this one place, right? So that's what we're trying to approximate, is what is the m of this tangent line, of that instantaneous slope there. So the best that we've gotten so far when we plugged in this fairly small value of 0 0.1 was 11.41. If we wanted to get more accurate values from this uh, numerical way of figuring out what does the slope start to work towards, we could use just smaller and smaller h, right? 0 0.01, 0 0.0000001, and we'll be able to get better and better, more accurate results. However, if we want to get it perfectly, we have to use the derivative. Hey, a problem about the derivative for f of x equals x cubed, then evaluating f prime of negative 2. And so once again, f prime of negative 2 tells us the instantaneous slope of our graph at this value, negative 2. So figuring out f of negative 2 will tell us the slope. The slope of this is going to be this value that we get from f prime of negative 2. All right, so how do we figure out f prime? Well, remember, f prime of x is equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. In this case, our f of x is equal to x cubed. So we can swap this out for the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h. So f of x plus h becomes x plus h cubed. Right? We're plugging in x plus h into how it works over here. So x plus h cubed minus, now we're just plugging in x, so simply x cubed all over h. What is x plus h cubed? Let's just work that out in a quick sidebar. x plus h cubed, we can write that as x plus h times x plus h squared. x plus h times x plus h squared, that becomes x squared plus 2xh plus h squared, x plus h times x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. We get x cubed, x times 2xh, 2x squared h, h times x squared, 1hx squared, 1x squared h, so we get plus 3x squared h. Then x times h squared, so that's 1xh squared, h times 2xh, that's 2xh squared, so we get a total of 3xh squared plus h cubed h times h gets us h cubed. Notice that's also from the binomial, we can also get that through the binomial expansion. If you remember, if you recently worked on the binomial expansion, you might recognize that. All right, so at that point, we can plug back into our limit. Limit as h goes to 0, we swap out x plus h cubed for x cubed plus 3x squared h plus 3xh squared plus h cubed minus x cubed all divided by h. At this point, hey, we see we've got a positive x cubed and a negative x cubed. They knock each other out. Now we see, oh, hey, everything has an h, and great. Currently, if we were to just plug in h goes to 0, we'd get 0 plus 0 plus 0 divided by 0. It's 0 over 0. We can't do that, right? But hey, we can knock out the dividing by 0 because everything up top now has a factor of h in it. So we can knock out this h here. That knocks the h out here. Turns this h squared into an h to the 1. Turns this h cubed into an h squared. And we've now got the limit as h goes to 0 of 3x squared 
plus 3xh plus h squared. So as the limit as h goes to 0, well, that's going to cause 3xh to just turn into 0, right? As h goes to 0, it'll crush the x. As h squared goes to 0, it'll crush h squared to 0. So as h goes to 0 in h squared, it'll crush h squared to 0. And that leaves us with just 3x squared. Great. So f prime of x is equal to 3x squared. So now we were asked to find what is the specific derivative at f prime of negative 2. So f prime of negative 2 equals what? Well, f prime of x equals 3x squared. So f prime of negative 2 will be 3 negative 2 squared. 3 times negative 2 squared, 3 negative 2 becomes 4. So we've got 3 times 4, and we get 12. The instantaneous slope of the point of the horizontal location, negative 2, is a slope of 12, which, if you can remember from that last example that we were just working to, when we had point 0.1, we'd managed to get to 11.41. As we were making our h smaller and smaller, we were slowly working our way to this perfectly instantaneous slope of 12, working our way to the derivative at negative 2. Cool. Next one, find the derivative of f of x equals 1 over x. Same basic method here, limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h, sorry, f prime, the derivative, f prime of x is going to be equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. So we start working this out, limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x, well, x plus h We'll plug into our formula f of x equals 1 over x. So f of thing equals 1 over thing. So if we plug in x plus h for our thing, we have 1 over x plus h minus f of x is simply going to be 1 over x, all divided by h. Oh, whoops. Forgot one important part equals limit as h goes to 0 of that stuff. We have to keep up that limit because it is very important. Limit as h goes to 0 of all of this stuff. So now, from when we worked with finding limits, where we've got fractions on top of a, inside of a fraction. Well, what we want is less fractions, right? We don't want fractions in fractions. So how can we get rid of the fractions up top? Well, notice, if we multiply by the top, we can cancel out those fractions with x times x plus h. That'll cancel out the right fraction and the left fraction on the top. So we'll be left with some stuff, but we have to multiply the top and the bottom of any fraction by the same thing. Otherwise, we just have wishful thinking. So x times x plus h on the top and the bottom. So we've got this is equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of 1 over x plus h times x times x plus h. Well, that x plus h here will cancel out the x plus h here, and we'll be left with just x. So we get x minus quantity here. The x cancels out the x here, and we're going to be left with x plus h minus x plus h all over. Well, we can't cancel out anything on the bottom, right? We've just got h. And if you remember from our finding limits, it's actually going to behoove us to be able to keep the h there, because our goal, since we're going to have h go to 0, we can't divide by 0. So we need to somehow get that h at the bottom to cancel out and be canceled out. Otherwise, our limit will wind up getting screwed up by that h still being there. So h times x times x plus h on the bottom. At this point, we see we've got x minus quantity x plus h. So x minus quantity x plus h, well, that minus h in here, oh, whoops, ah, I accidentally cut out the wrong thing there. Should not have crossed out the h. I should have crossed out x plus h. Should have crossed out the x. The minus x here cancels out the positive x here. And we're left with the limit as h goes to 0 of negative h divided by h times x times x plus h. Great. So we've got the h here on the bottom and the h here on the top. So we can cancel out h here, h here, that leaves us with negative 1 on the top. So the limit as h goes to 0 of negative 1 all divided by x times x plus h. At this point, if h goes to 0, we won't have massive issues. Uh, let's see one more. So the limit as h goes to 0 of negative 1 over, we expand x and x plus h, we distribute that x over, and we get x squared plus x h. Now, as h goes to 0, that'll cause the x h to cancel out, but it'll have no effect on the x squared, so things don't wind up breaking as long as x isn't equal to 0, but we're looking just in general. So negative 1 over x squared is what winds up coming out of this. Negative 1 over x squared. So that means we can write, in general, f prime of x is equal to what we wound up getting of all of this in the end, 
negative 1 over x squared. Yay, great. All right. Finally, before we get to our final fourth example, let's talk about the power rule. So these are the sorts of rules that you'll wind up learning as you start working through calculus. One of the first and easiest rules to learn that makes it so much easier to take a derivative is the power rule. And what it says is that for any function f of x equals x to the n, where n is just any constant number, the derivative of f of x is f prime of x equals n times x to the n minus 1. So we take that power, we bring it down in front of it, right? We've got x to the n, right? x, sorry, x to the n, and then we bring it down in front of it, we've got n times, and then we bring our down our n to n minus 1. So you might not have noticed this yet, but this actually wound up holding true for all the functions we've worked, so, worked through so far in this lesson. Both in the early part of the lesson, we were setting up these ideas, and in example two and example three. When we took the derivative of f of x equals x squared plus one, it came out to be simply 2x. Don't be too worried about the plus one. Plus one we can think of as being x to the zero, so when you bring down that zero in front of it, it just cancels out and becomes nothing. So we got 2x out of it. When we had f of x equals x cubed, when we took the derivative of that in example two, we wound up getting 3 times x squared, right? The 3 went down in front, and we brought down 3 by 1 to 2. 3 minus 1 becomes 2. And finally, example 3 that we just worked on, f of x equals x times negative 1. We brought down the negative 1, and we got negative x, and negative 1 minus 1 becomes negative 2. So we've wound up seeing this inadvertently, and this winds up being true for any constant number n, right? It really works for anything at all. If you're curious about seeing this some more, try looking at what would happen if you tried to take the derivative through that formal h goes to 0 of x to the fourth, f of x to the fourth. Try working through the formal definition of x to the fourth. And if you really want to try seeing how it works for any integer at all, or any positive integer at least, try using the binomial theorem. And it even works for anything at all, as we've just seen for negative numbers. But you can wind up seeing how it works for binomial theorem as well. So if you're curious about this, try checking it out. It's pretty easy to wind up seeing with the binomial theorem that it winds up being true for any positive integer. All right, let's put this to use. So using that power rule, find an equation for the tangent line to the function f of x equals x to the fourth that passes through 3 comma 81. So if we're going to pass through 3 comma 81, let's first get a sense of what's going on. If we draw just a real quick sketch of what's going on here. x to the fourth shoots up really, really quickly, right? We shoot up massively, very, very quickly with x to the fourth, right? By the time we've made it to a horizontal x location of 3, we are spitting out an output of 81, right? 3 to the fourth is 9 times 9, which is 81. So we're at this very, very high point very, very quickly. So what we're going to want to find is we want to find the tangent line to the function at this point, 3 comma 81. So we want to find something that winds up going like this, right? That's what we're looking for. What is the slope at this? Well, to find the slope at any given horizontal location, at any point, we wind up taking the derivative. So how can we take the derivative if we've got f of x equals x to the fourth, f of x equals x to the fourth. The power rule says that we can get the derivative, f prime of x, by taking the exponent and bringing it down in the front. So we've got 4 times x, and the exponent goes subtract by 1. So 4 minus 1 becomes 4 times x cubed. So if we want to find out what is the slope, so the slope at x equals 3, right? That's the horizontal location we're, considered, we're considering. Slope at x equals 3, if we want to find out what the slope is for our tangent line. The slope at x equals 3 is going to be f prime of 3. f prime of 3 will be 4 times 3 cubed, right? We plug it into our f prime, our derivative function. f prime of 3 equals 4 times 3 cubed. 4 times 3 cubed, 3 cubed is 27. 4 times 27 equals 108. So we now know that the slope of our tangent line is 108. So if we're going to work out the tangent line, so our tangent line is going to wind up using this slope, m equals 108. So any line, any line at all, can be described by slope-intercept form. 
It's a really good form to have memorized. Y equals mx plus b. You always want to keep that one in your back pocket. Always useful. Y equals mx plus b. Well, we just figured out that the slope, if it's going to be the tangent, it must have a slope of 108 because f prime, the instantaneous slope at 3, f prime of 3, comes out to be 108. So we know the instantaneous slope at the point we're interested in, 3 comma 81, is 108. So that means we've got y equals 108x plus some b that we haven't figured out now. So how can we figure out what is b to finish creating our, our uh, equation for the tangent line, right? If you're going to figure out what a tan what any line is, you need to know what the slope is and what the y-intercept is, what m is and what b is. So, at least if you're using slope-intercept. y equals 108x plus b. Well, do we know any points on that line? Yeah, we're looking at the tangent line. And we were told that the tangent line passes through the point 3, 81. So we can plug in the point 3, 81 because we know that our tangent line has to pass through the one point that it barely, barely just feather touches on that curve. So we plug in 3, 81, so that's 81 for our y value, equals 108 times 3 for our horizontal value x plus b. 81 equals 108 times 3, that comes out to be 324, plus b, 81 minus 324 is negative 243 for our b, so now we know negative 243 equals b, we know what our slope is, so that means we can describe the tangent line in general as y equals 108 times x minus 243. y equals mx plus b with our m and b filled in. And now we have the tangent line that passes through the point 3, 81 and is tangent to the curve created by x to the fourth. Pretty cool. Calculus gives us a whole bunch of stuff that we can wind up doing with the derivative. The derivative is this massively, massively useful, important thing. And we are just, just barely touching the surface of how incredibly useful and cool this thing is. As you work through calculus, you'll wind up learning a whole bunch of things that the derivative lets us do, lets us learn about a function. It's really, really amazing how much information it gives us. Calculus is really, really cool. I hope at some point you get the chance to take calculus and get to see how many cool things there are. And remember, when you work with the derivative, what you're looking at is what is the slope of that location, of that that point or that horizontal location on your graph. All right, we'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.